Welcome to another episode of the Good Sugar Podcast. Today, Ralph and I are joined by Dr. Judd, who's a neuroscientist and a psychiatrist. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about Ralph's donut binge. He's a neuroscientist. He also has a new book out called The Hunger Habit, which is why we eat when we are not hungry and how to stop. He's a professor and a director of research at Brown University's Mindfulness Center. He loves to the combination of bringing in modern science and ancient wisdom. He's known as Dr. Judd. It's Dr. Judson Brewer. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks in the for interest coming. of full disclosure, this is take two, but I like to be very honest with our audience. So we, we had a little bit of a flub and we're back in right now. And the reason why I was very excited to bring you in, and we'll try and cliff note this this time, is that your book focuses on bad eating habits, not just um, mindless consumption, but also overeating and when you eat, when you're not hungry and all that stuff. And I, last night, <clears throat> for no reason whatsoever, ordered in three donuts, didn't even enjoy them, felt disgusting afterwards, didn't sleep well. And I figured, wow, what a great time to bring on this guy and figure out what the fuck is going on in my brain and why did I do it? Well, we got a neuroscientist to help you yeah, with this. <laughs> exactly. Who focuses on this stuff. Yeah. Great. So let's dive in. Yeah. And we can use this, you know, the the donut episode as an example of how this process gets set up and importantly, and how we can break it. So mm -hmm. you want to just dive in right there? I think yeah. that'd be a great place to start. So let's do it. Yeah. So the one thing that I'll highlight is that the triggers are the least important part of the equation where mm -hmm. a lot of people, they get stuck and they think, oh, I got to figure out the triggers and then I can you know, avoid them or, or um, solve them. This process is called reward based learning. It's not called trigger uh, or cue based learning or, or whatever we want to call that that prompts a, uh, a behavior. Uh, and here the way that it works is that if if we do a behavior, let's say eat a donut and it's eat rewarding. Three donuts, let's be honest. Okay. So yeah, and this will be good. So I'm guessing this isn't the first time you've ever eaten donuts. No. Is that fair to say? <clears throat> that is fair to say. So probably sometime in your history, you had donuts and they tasted good. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and you probably don't even need to remember that. I I remember my brother used to work at Dunkin' Donuts when he was in high school, and he would bring a garbage bag full of them home at night <laughs> and we'd throw them in the freezer. And then in one entire summer, I think all I ate, I was on a donut diet, <laughs> and right. that's all I ate. But I could do that in, in junior high school and high school because, you know, I was... It, you know, my metabolism was fine with it. And I, and I didn't, I didn't really notice the, uh, all of the sugar rushes and crashes that I certainly notice more now. Right. For sure. Yeah. So we set up this reward value of donuts where our brain says, Hey, donuts taste good. And the way that that perpetuates is that just becomes the see donut habit. You know, I, in medical school, I had a, there was a saying from a, a surgeon who would, it's like, see a donut, eat a donut. And as in like, when you get a chance to eat, eat. Right. Okay. And of course they always had donuts in the, you know, <laughs> in the, in the, um, call rooms and whatnot. So for, for that, not, not a great way to, to in, help residents learn to eat. Right. Cause we're, you know, we're sleep deprived and stressed. And then all the, all, there's all this junk food. <laughs> so it's but also can I imagine to extrapolate as when we were, uh, nomadic, see something, eat it because you don't know when the next time a fucking meal is going to be around. Exactly. Exactly. And so we, our bodies would try to lay all that down as, as fat in our body so it could be ready for the next famine. Mm -hmm. So that way that works in modern day is that most of us have access to food, yet that process isn't still in place. And so we start associating eating with other things. So for example, you know, somebody's retiring at work or there's a birthday. Well, guess what? It's going to be donuts and cake, right? And so we learn to eat not when we're hungry, but with celebrations. And then there's a leftover donut and somebody's feeling angry or frustrated because they just got a bad review at work. Well, they eat the donut and they distract themselves and they feel better. So those are the positive and negative reinforcement processes that, that reinforce these behaviors that set up this reward-based learning. That's a really critical impact piece of information for people to know because otherwise it's just this 
this black box of their brain that they're fighting with. And this is mm -hmm. where the, the myth of willpower comes in, where people just think they need more willpower. Willpower is not even discussed in neuroscience. Like wow. we don't, it's not part of the equation. So meaning like if someone is like really strong in that mindset to do or not do things, he's getting up to go to the gym every day or he's going to, it doesn't mean anything in terms of this reward based learning. It, it doesn't. And often we associate mindset with like, oh, I've got a lot of willpower. But when we really look at it and explore it, we can ask these questions like, well, how does it feel when you get up and go to the gym? And people are like, well, it feels pretty good. Mm -hmm. Well, that's reward based learning. Yeah. I mean, I'm about <laughs> saying like, that but not, I've got not... the right mindset. No, you've got the right reward structure. You're seeing very clearly that it's rewarded. Right. I mean, I've seen this with me, like I, as Marcus knows, I started running for the first time in my life a few years ago. The feeling I feel when I'm home showered after a long run early in the morning, and I know most of my friends are not even up yet. I have this like elated feeling of accomplishment that I did all this and it's not even 8 a.m. yet yeah. is a great feeling to me. And that I chase that feeling now for sure. Yeah. And that's what sets good habits. And that also sets up how to break unhealthy habits, right? So if, if we go back to the donuts, describe what happened after you ate the, well, start with how they tasted and then how, what was it like after you ate them? Well, A, they weren't great, which pissed me off, but didn't piss me off enough to not eat all three of them. So let's start <laughs> with that. But B, I did not sleep well. I was, very, I felt nauseous afterwards. Was, I probably ingested I don't know, Marcus, you'd know better than me. Three donuts, 1,800 calories maybe, 2,000 calories? Could be. I mean, I don't know what's in them. I mean, obviously, but that sounds yeah. okay. That could be that. And then I just felt sick and I felt nauseous and I felt angry at myself. And just the worst part is the, I didn't sleep at all last night. I know that's why. Yeah. So how excited are you right now to go back and repeat that behavior? Right now, it's not going to happen. I can't tell you how I could feel three days from now, but right now, the thought of eating another donut makes me want to throw up. So three days from now, let's just project ourselves into the future. And three days from now, uh, I was sitting next to you and you're like, oh, Grubhub's open. I'm going to order these donuts. And I said, hey, just recall what it was like the last time you did that. Right. Right. Yeah. And how would and would you you'd be like, well, I'm going to order six now. Yeah. Well, I would try and say, I mean, here's the thing. I do have that um, issue where I sit on the couch sometimes and I put a dessert in and out of my Grubhub cart until finally good good brain beats out bad brain. They have a term for that. They have a huh? term for that. They have a term for that. What's that? Uh, I'm not sure, but there's definitely a term for someone who puts things into the shopping cart that they don't want and then takes them out. There's got to be a <laughs> clinical term for that in the modern <laughs> concern. You know, I would say just going back to this thing about willpower, you know, when when you said that willpower is not a factor in this, you know, and I, 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 I agree uh, that for the purpose of being helpful to myself, I should be, you know, really clear on the words that I'm using if I'm trying to explain something. And I think willpower sounds more like a metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I'll, and I'll say why very specifically, because everything is willpower at this point. We're, we're, we, we, it's our willpower. We decide to, if we're going to live or die today, in, 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 in essence, we're not in a child situation where we have no control over what's happening. So I think to say willpower is, is, you know, you could say that he's willing something even when he's making that mistake. There's willpower in that, too, because he's trying to manifest something or change his reality. What I would say is that what willpower represents to me when I don't do something that I know um, is not good for me or even the willpower to do things that I know are good for me. What it really is in that moment is it's that at that moment when I can resist, I have my self-esteem. Mm -hmm. I'm in a relaxed state. I'm not in an anxious state of mind. So it means I'm making decisions and I'm not completely controlled by my subconscious mind. I'm in the present moment. And I have a bag of tricks and it takes my so-called decision to open that bag of tricks, things that I will like, whether it's prayer or meditation, or maybe I go to the gym instead, the, the diversion that I create for myself or write poetry or do, you know, do something with the kids. I, I think, yes, the word willpower sounds really dated. And, 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 and I think, there, but I do think there is a word, a word or a, a term that could sort of replace that. I, I leave it to you because 
I, I ask you to help me because I think I, I do think that there is some willpower in this. Yeah, I would. Uh, I agree that the term willpower is dated, and I would also say it has such a kind of it, it is such gravitas in in society today that I would I would use a term like um, like decision making or cognitive control. Mm -hmm. And so, and I specifically use, for example, decision making or cognitive control because if you look at uh, if you talk to the, you know, like in our neuroscience circles, nobody uses the word willpower. There's not any evidence <laughs> that it exists, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of work around decision-making and the decision-making comes from how rewarding a behavior is. So, I'll, you know, I'll ask you, you've got this bag of tricks. How's it feel when you use those tricks as compared to when you don't? You're asking me? Yeah. yeah. You're the one with the bag of tricks, Marcus. Um, well, the answer to that question is it really depends on for that. We'll say for that given day, uh, what I prepared the previous day, the work that I did pr the previous day. And I would say that most of the time, um, if I don't meditate mm -hmm. or breathe in the morning, uh, I'll probably do that for two or three days straight. And then I'll feel the anxiety. I'll feel it when I wake up. I'll feel like, hey, everything's the same. Nothing's changed. I'm waking up the same wife, the same family. I'm doing the same thing. Nothing's different. But I don't, my heart rate feels a little faster. Or maybe I'm a little bit quiet. My wife might say, uh, is something wrong? And I'll be like, I don't think so. But I'm in a, I'm in a down mode. And then hopefully that somewhere throughout the day, I'm really going to become aware of of what's going on. Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll likely come up with, you know, the stuff that I write about the most now is this condition that seems to have been probably the bigger pandemic of all pandemics in humanity is chronic anxiety, in my layman's opinion. That anxiety is a natural thing that is designed to help us navigate the uh, exterior world. But because of uh, many factors, childhood issues, society, whatever, um, we stay in a chronic state of anxiety, which that's where humans create. That's where we create our havoc and our nonsense. Um, you know, that's the, 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 the seat of my addictions in life uh, was anxiety, the uncomfortable feelings that anxiety is. It's, it's a form of pain. Isn't, and, doctor, you had a paper called Managing Your Anxiety, and it's the most prevalent mental disorder worldwide, right? Was that, that was yours? You know, it's on your website. Yeah. So I, and I wrote a whole book, you know, called oh, Unwinding you. Anxiety about that. And actually in, in the book, if we want to get into it, I argued that uh, anxiety is actually not helpful from a survival standpoint. You, 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 Marcus, you might be talking about fear. Fear is absolutely helpful for survival. If you look at anxiety, it may be this evolutionary bottleneck where we've brought fear together with future planning. So fear is helpful, planning is helpful, but fear of the future has never been shown to be helpful, though it hasn't stopped people from thinking that, you know, or finding some way to rationalize having anxiety. I'm using anxiety as a loose word because I'm not obviously directly in your industry. Yeah. Um, the word that I'm looking for is the vibration. The fear to me is, mm -hmm. a, it's, it's, you'll see it. It's in my face. It's in my body language. Anxiety, I could be on stage singing. I could be entertaining. So and to me, whatever the word would be, is yeah. it's, it's not as obvious as fear. It's fear prevalent. It's a state of mind where I don't feel present. I'm not grounded. I'm not mm -hmm. in the now. Mm -hmm. And why I use the word anxiety is because its cousin is fear or its mother is fear. It's the same. It's in the same it's, ballpark. it's, it's right. the same ballpark. It's just not a relaxed state. So whatever terminology yeah. neuroscientists would say, whether it's parasympathetic or sympathetic brain or, you know, these different systems that you guys are, are tracking. Um, you know, I know you're I know enough about your field to know that you guys have a lot of stuff, a lot of fancy <laughs> stuff, but don't know a lot of stuff, too. Like you have no concept of what ignites consciousness. There's no, there's no two neuroscientists are going to say this is what con this is what creates consciousness, which is probably the biggest question that could come out of 
your field is the understanding of consciousness itself and what is it? No, no, no one, no, no one knows. So now it's just like semantics. I would use any word that you would give me to describe what I felt like when I was two and I wasn't getting eye contact and that type of motherly love, mm -hmm. that feeling that I had that I've carried for my entire life and that I could breathe out and nothing else works. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I agree with you, people have been debating consciousness for thousands of years and it probably hasn't gotten us very far <laughs> pragmatically, <laughs> right? So I think it sounds like we're on the same page in terms of both being pragmatists, you know, as a psychiatrist, I just want to figure out what's going to help people. For example, with that unsettled, ungrounded, itchy, urgy feeling that says do something. Send them to a monastery. It's going to work every time. Everyone, <laughs> every tough person you get, send them to a monastery and just tell them to meditate. Yeah. And then what happens when they leave the monastery? So hopefully, <laughs> but hopefully, no, you're right. You're right. You know, I'm half joking when I say that <laughs> the ultimate solution is to just start mm -hmm. over from scratch and learn how to be in the moment. And mm -hmm. here's a bunch of tools. And now you can come back to your hack, your hectic life and figure out how attached you're going to get. I mean, I, I, I am obsessed, by the way. I have like a total man crush on the neuroscientist. I'm sure you know him, Donald Hoffman. You know who Donald Hoffman is? I actually don't. I'm sorry. sorry. I, I figured he's a hot topic. He's all over the Internet now. Jordan Peterson is interviewing him. Everyone's interviewing him. He's just a really nice guy from University of Southern California or Davis, whatever it is that is putting his neck on the line because he's got tenure in the field to try to he's his he's proposing with his team that consciousness creates space time not the reverse and he's trying to use his science combined with a great knowledge of quantum physics to basically say that consciousness is fundamental which is a controversial thing i suppose in the world of the real right but it's, it really all ties into what we're doing here, what we're talking about in some kind of way. I would say pragmatically, we do have to be conscious to change behaviors. And we also have to be conscious of what the results of the behaviors are and where consciousness comes from. Or, you know, I, I think we could plenty of people go down these discussion rabbit holes around, you know, quantum physics and consciousness. I, honestly, that I, I don't find that particularly for me. It's not as interesting as like, how can we actually help people break bad habits? True. true. Right, well, let, let's. <laughs> well, it's not, that it. talk is not for the layman. It doesn't help the layman who's yeah. so, suffering with addiction to figure out, you know, uh, if, if consciousness comes from whatever. Yes, I yeah. can help them. But yeah. so going back to the donut issue, <laughs> just because to, to bring it into the book, The Hunger Habit. What are something, I mean, I don't want to give away the whole book to you, but what's something you would say I should try to either remind myself or something I can do to start, because you talk about it, you can intentionally rewire your brain. So what is the uh, the next step, so to speak, or the first step? Yeah, well, I would say, you know, the the key for any type of habit change, whether it's changing an unhealthy eating habit or you know, getting out of an anxiety habit loop is awareness. Mm -hmm. So, and in particular, it's not just awareness. It's about awareness of the cause and effect relationship between the behavior and the result of the behavior. So whether it's worrying, we can ask, what do I get from worrying about something? Or whether it's eating three donuts, we can ask, what did I get from eating those three donuts? How Diarrhea. rewarding was it? What, what did you say? I said diarrhea. That's what I got from eating three donuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if we can, the more we pay attention as we do the behavior, the more that becomes, that helps us shift how rewarding it is in our brains. So mm -hmm. it'll, if we pay attention and we're like, wow, that was amazing. We get what's called a positive prediction error where our brain says, hey, remember that, do it more. If we say, hey, wow, I got diarrhea and I slept poorly. We get a negative prediction error where it says, hey, Donuts might not be the best thing to eat. Well, you know. let me say this. So as I've said, I've been doing very well. And there's been times where I crave, I think it's an eight that you're going to crave something every now and then. <laughs> and when I did, I would just say, what are you doing? Just go get a, some fucking watermelon, go eat an apple, go outside, go do something. 80%, 90% of the time I'm doing that. Yeah. But every so often I don't. 
and then I'm eating three donuts. And I don't know why the first 10 times or first nine times I was able to make the, the choice that makes more sense. Mm -hmm. And that 10th time I gave in. Yeah. So this is where it's about whenever we give in, for example, it's really important to pay attention to the result of the behavior. So often we'll sit there and beat ourselves up. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Why did I give up, give in this time? Mm -hmm. Instead, I would say lean in and say, okay, you did it. What can you learn from it? And right. if you can lay that down in memory, that's going to be really helpful. Like have a be Google note that says donuts equals diarrhea. Yeah. Yeah. And that Google note has to go into your brain and it has to be felt in your body. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that our brains predict future behavior based on past behavior. That's what our brains are very good at doing. They're prediction machines. Makes sense. And so if you put the donut in your Grubhub app, your brain, it, if you are conscious, if you're not conscious, you're just going to do this on autopilot. Right. But if you're conscious, your brain's going to simulate, well, what was it like the last time I ate a donut? And then it'll remember diarrhea, slept poorly, blah, 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 blah. It'll come out of your card pretty easily because your brain's like, why would I do that? Right. Right. And so it helps you break that habit where it's just automatic, put the donut in because you're simulating what's going to happen next. And then if you, if you don't have enough disenchantment built in, you just eat the donut and you gather that, you gather that data set so that it makes it easier the next time. Notice how none of that has to do with the, you know, the grit, I shouldn't eat the donut. It's yeah, really or about it doesn't also doesn't have to go with trying to figure out why am I being triggered by donuts? Like what makes me want that yeah. is not is not as important. The, the, it doesn't matter. Yeah, whatever yeah. it was. You're, you're, say, you're saying that you have a science behind that, and and I and I I'm not, it's not that I am in disbelief of that. It just doesn't make a lot of total logic to me yet. The point that you're making, which is that if, for example, um, I get fired from my job. And two days later, the fear of financial insecurity, the lack, you know, the loss of my self-esteem, I, I lost something, um, prompts, negative messages, I'm no good, mm -hmm. worries, whatever it is. And by day four, I am uh, walking by a bar and I step in, I sit down, I have a drink and I relapse and I start drinking again. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I would say that I'm the kind of person that, when I get sober again, I'm going to learn to identify some of these major prompts that would actually lead me to drink. And so what I would do differently, according to my own recovery, is I would say, okay, it's five years later. I got fired from my job. Uh, I'm going to call my sponsor. I'm going to go to an extra meeting. I'm going to do a fourth step. I'm going to do some prayer meditation. I'm going to start working on a job. And I skip over the relapse the next time mm -hmm. because I created something. Yeah. Uh, how, how is what I'm saying in contradiction to what you're saying, or is it the same thing? It's probably the same thing. So I, we could, we could check to see if it is or not by asking you, if you compare the skipping over the relapse to the relapse, which one's more rewarding? Well, the, the whole thing, you know, again, not, you know, this, not to, uh, I'm not getting paid for this, but reward is relative, right? Because you could say that I have a neurosis that in order to stay connected to my really negative mother, who's not in my life anymore, I seek out negativity within my relationships. Or if it's not there, I create it because it's a noise that I'm familiar with and I'm conditioned to create it so the reward even though it's an annoyance and something negative i'm being reward i'm you, the, the payoff actually is the word that i the payoff is that in that moment my subconscious mind must think that it did something to improve the situation so i don't really even know how to say what the reward is different other than i somewhere in my mind connect skipping the relapse as my chances of surviving the payoff is that I get to live, that I have fear that if I go back another time, I might not make it back. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, survival is more rewarding or okay. more, the payoff is better than not surviving. But even going, you know, you touched on how we might have some negative self-image or we stay in a, an abusive relationship or something like that. 
we also have to remember that from a survival standpoint, our brains are looking for our comfort zones, our safety, you know, the safety of the cave. And that comes with, well, I know this, I, ha I haven't died yet when I'm in this cave. And then anytime we venture outside the cave, we don't know if it's going to be more dangerous or less dangerous. And so if we've been in that safety, that comfort zone for so long, it is uncomfortable. That's the whole point of why it's called the comfort zone. It is mm -hmm. uncomfortable to step out of it because our, our survival brain is saying, is this dangerous when in reality, it just might be different. So we need to recognize that, you know, change is uncomfortable. And if we don't recognize it, our survival brain is going to say, oh, this is uncomfortable. It must be dangerous. And we're going to run back into the cave, even though the, the cave may not be the most, you know, on a grand scheme of things, the cave may not be the most the most beneficial cave for right. us. I mean, I, by the way, I do that often in my life. I like to put myself in uncomfortable situations because I feel I'm going to grow from them. So mm -hmm. I will like take a class where I don't know anybody or don't know anything or go do something that's totally out of my, like I just went to it. Uh, a um a birthday dinner for a friend of mine and i knew nobody there normally i was like why am i gonna go i don't fucking know anybody but like no go be uncomfortable go make and i made it out of my way to go on and talk to everybody as much as possible because it's not something i would normally do and i like doing shit like that now and then yeah that's the growth zone so when we learn to lean into the discomfort it's less uncomfortable it's more comfortable because it's familiar like un discomfort is familiar and i think a lot you know especially in modern day it there's so many ways that we can distract ourselves to the point where we have lost our ability to tolerate discomfort it it makes it much harder to go out and do what you just did for example right and by the way that's what i would hate to say but like the younger generation you hear things all the time about wanting safe spaces and things like that because they don't want to be uncomfortable. Yeah. And I would assume that's going to prohibit growth in the long run. It is. It is. And we even see that there are <clears throat> there are laws being passed as we speak uh, for college campuses to be defunded if they challenge students and make them feel uncomfortable. It's weird. Yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting topsy-turvy, right? We went the other direction for decades where there was insensitivity, and then now it goes back, the, the pendulum swing goes back where it's so sensitive that you can't move. But I think another, when we talked about willpower, what came up for me was, um, what, what also came up for me in willpower is, um, a better word is just my character. It's not necessarily mm. willpower. Yeah. Uh, and I, when I thought about my character, I said that resistance to a negative thing, whatever that might be, oftentimes boils down to what's happening in my character for that moment. And also, um, sorry, because, you know, I, I, I never really articulate this stuff, but I, but I do think about it for myself. And, and there's no one really to articulate it to unless I'm on a podcast. But I, I would say is that what willpower represents for me in a in a in a in a quick moment is a build up to all of the steps and tools and workshops that I've been doing the previous weeks and months and days. So so in that moment when I need willpower or or superpower or higher consciousness or whatever you want to call it, it you know, it might not be there unless it's been something I've been working on. And I and I wanted to ask you in that vein because in in your in your field um, uh, do you have a list of things that you guys readily accept that are instinctual the way most creatures are completely ex ex uh, instinctual and we're cerebral thinkers with free will? Are there certain things that you think are instinctual, such as um, that cave that you were talking about, that we're all looking for that cave? Is that learned or is that really something that's embedded in the program? It's actually both. So let's explore this. So let's start with the embedded in the program. We, if, if we put our hand on a hot stove embedded in the program is to quickly pull our hand away. Yeah, exactly. The reflex to the point where that doesn't even go past the spinal cord. It doesn't even make it to our brain. We're going to respond so quickly. Woo! Yeah. 
Yeah. What a, what a machine. What a machine. Wait, yeah, I you're, know. Saying, you're saying it doesn't even have to go up the spinal cord because is that a fly, fight or flight mechanism or is that an even better one? It's even better. So it's it's only three synapses that that are required for that to happen. Uh, sensory to spinal cord, spinal cord inner neuron, if I'm remembering correctly, and then to the motor uh, to or to the muscle, right? The the neural synapse that then triggers the muscle to fire. Yeah, three three synapses. If I'm if I've got that right, Does every creature ha every creature has that essentially. Well, that has a spinal cord, you know, hmm. but but. If you look at the most primitive, I should say, and if you look at the most primitive nervous system that's been mapped out, the sea slug, I think it has 20,000 neurons or something. Mm -hmm. It it has, and even uh, single cell organisms, they are programmed to approach nutrient and avoid toxin, right? They don't even have neurons, right? The single cell. Neurons, so Neurons don't exist. <laughs> for for amoeba, yeah, it's they're they're one big. No, that, that's what um that's what Donald Hoffman says in his uh in his his theory. They don't exist unless you're looking at them. Okay, great. So, <laughs> so uh, great can, answer, Doc. Great. Yeah. Now what? I love it. I love it. No, it goes on. But go finish your saying. So the amoeba so jumps away from recoils from pain. Yeah, it's one two three. Out food. Yeah. yeah, and so this also forms for for anything sea slug and beyond where there are enough neurons to form memory. This is where the approach avoidance piece can help us learn. Mm -hmm. And so we learn, Oh, that stove is hot. And so we don't have to keep touching it and reacting. We can learn to avoid it because it's hot. We remember that it's hot. And this is you, what you said about character reminded me of this great saying. I don't even remember who said it, um, but if you go on the internet, it'll be attributed to anybody from Lao Tzu to God knows who else did, you know, and, and it's, um, it, it's watch your thoughts. They become your words, watch your words. They become your actions, watch your actions. They become your habits, watch your habits. They become your character, watch your character. It becomes your destiny, right? So here we can start to see how these actions and even these reactions become learned and they can even be thoughts that then form you know, downstream effects on our behaviors, our habits, our character, and our then, chemistry on our chemistry. Can I? Yeah. I'm going to tie into something that just happened to me, also, since I'm trying to make this about me for some stupid reason. But donuts again? Um, Back to donuts. I went, no, no. I went. I went away with a girl, uh, and when we had only we'd only video chatted, and when we met in person, she was, and it's, there's a reason for this. She uh, believes in pro women stuff and doesn't shave at all. She had very hairy arms, very hairy legs. And I was turned off and I realized that myself, I am programmed to find that disgusting because that's Western ideology. And it really bothered me that I looked at it that way because it's a learned behavior. Is that a fair, uh, you know, uh, assessment of what you're saying? It is. And this highlights that habits aren't just individual. They can also be societal. You know, right. We learn societally where we're told, oh, this is this is desirable. This is not desirable. So, so much of what makes up who we are comes from that outer ring. Absolutely. It's wild. Because really it, it, because about. because it even affects how our parents think, how our parents raise us. So right. it's every it's society is uh, it's it's all interconnected. It's it's all it's all one thing. Let it's me say this. I know I know Mark is. Did you understand that, out. Ralph? Did you? I do, but he has okay. a heart out in four minutes, so we okay. have to Sorry. wrap we, with him. We said everything. We said everything back <laughs> another time. But the book is called The Hunger Habit. Uh, you could go to drjud, which is drjud.com, or at dr.jud, which is dr.jud on Instagram. A few books, all several bestsellers. Uh, really honored to have you on. We barely scratched the surface of so many things we wanted to talk to you about. I would love to get you back on the show. I could ask you two questions that could sum it all up. Um, um, That's not even one. You, wait, okay, here we go. Uh, <laughs> divine creation or God? Which one would you pick? Divine creation or God? Yes. Like like which, the same what, thing. How, this, I don't even know what it means. It's the first question. I have two oh. more. Two more. For yeah, I would say both. Okay. Are, do you consider yourself more of a scientist with a phd or a philosopher with a head start i guess a scientist with a phd but i'm kind of biased because i am a scientist with a phd 
Are, do you, but do you at least consider yourself a little bit of a philosopher too? Oh, a hundred percent. So I didn't know it was, it, I would say both. I was and. Okay. Yeah, I think well, yeah. you, you should have said a scientist who believes in philosophy or a philosopher that has a PhD. That's the better Ooh. question. Well, and, and then the last thing is I, I, I love studies. I love all the tests. I love that stuff. It's all up for grabs, but would you say that 90% of what your field is about is theoretical and philosophical more than it is a hundred percent like mathematics can be uh you know how physics can be proved in, a, in a, an equation and surgery is surgery you cut this way you take out the problem is your field more abstract than it is actual hard science well i would say because you know i'm i'm a psychiatrist and also a neuroscientist so the neuroscientists can sometimes get caught in the esoteric, I think, like you're talking about. Myself, I'm a I'm a translational neuroscientist because I'm a clinician. And so everything that I'm doing is trying is more along the lines of the surgeon. Like what can we do to actually change behavior? Right. Even your reaction to the no new neu no neuron thing was like, okay, great. Now let's get to the problem, <laughs> which I love. Uh, doctor, thank you so much for coming on. We hope to have you on again. Uh, you can follow me over at I am Ralph Sutton, my other podcast called the SDR Show. The Good Sugar Store is on 3rd Avenue and 69th Street. And uh, you go to see the giant yellow sign. We're all running the Spartan Race coming up in mid-June. If you DM me on Instagram, you can get in for free. Doctor, thank you so much for coming on. And we'll see everyone next time on the Good Sugar Podcast. 